Hey, welcome back to Metropol Grid. My name is Andre. Thanks so much for tuning in. Today, we're going to be talking about agendas. This problem has always stood. Whenever you're putting together a corp deck, it's trying to understand what sort of agenda distributions, what sort of compositions in your corp deck can make your deck more or less defensible against accesses from the runner. It's not a very intuitive problem all the time. Say, for example, you're putting together a corp deck and you think, I want to put a lot of three point agendas in the deck. That means that there are not many agendas per card in my deck. However, the runner has a chance of winning on as few as three accesses. Overall, is that a good strategy or is that worse than, say, playing something that has more two pointers or one pointers in the list? Again, there are more agendas in the deck itself, but the runner needs to get more accesses to win usually. And that's the sort of problem I've been very fascinated with over the last couple of weeks. And I'm really excited to finally get this video out because for the first time, we are fully releasing our agenda density calculator. This is a really quick Python script that you can get below. The GitHub link is there. Now, this command line script will allow you to input any sort of deck and agenda composition, and it'll output some statistics on how many accesses the runner needs to, on average, win at least 50% of the time against it. So, for example, here we have a 49 card deck. We're running 10 agendas, including three three pointers, four two pointers, and three one pointers. That's one agenda per 4.9 cards, but very importantly, the runner hits a 50% plus win rate as long as they access 17 agendas. So with this sort of script, you can very quickly make some changes to maybe your, your agenda distribution and see how that impacts that very important number. If number goes up, generally good for corporation. What can we do to get there? Now, I do understand that some people might be intimidated by this sort of command line Python script thing, and I get that. Unfortunately, here at the Metropol Grid, we're pretty bad at doing anything in moderation. So for that crowd, I went ahead and again, for the first time ever today, we are now releasing, link in the description, the entire agenda density chart. I went through and automated every single agenda composition that you can reasonably run within standard or startup, and it's all here with all the data. It turns out there's 249 different ways to make uh, the requisite points in a 49 card deck in standard. So this information is all here. It's all available. So if you never want to play with the script and do some graphing, you don't have to. But this video is going to be talking about all the information from this, the methodology of what we're measuring, how we got here, how the script works and how you can use it. And then finally, at the end, we're going to be talking about this data and what we think this data means and how we can use it to our advantage in both the standard and the startup format. Now, there are going to be timestamps below, and if you're the sort of person watching who just wants to hear about the results and what we can glean from them, go ahead and jump to the ending. The timestamp will be there, but I would heavily recommend that you at least tune in for this next little section, which we're going to talk about the methodology on what exactly we are measuring. It's inherently very hard to simulate Netrunner, so we're going to have to make some pretty large sweeping assumptions. So understanding what we're measuring and sort of the downsides to that and the sort of caveats you have to keep in mind when trying to parse this data is going to be of the utmost importance. So just tune into that before you jump into the results. It'd probably be for the best. And on that note, it might be obvious, I've been working away at this for weeks. This has been a pretty large project that kind of got away from me. So a lot of time has gone into this, but I'm very excited to finally get this out. If you find this to be interesting or helpful in any way, if you could do it as little as like this video, leave a comment, share this with a friend, subscribe to the channel. Those are fantastic ways to help support the Metropol Grid and help us grow. And with that, let's start talking about what exactly we're doing here. So this all goes back to a number that I was taught many, many years ago when I started learning Netrunner. And I was told that on average, for a runner to have at least a 50% win rate against any corporation, they largely need to get 17 to 18 accesses. And that's not a number that I really understood where it came from, but it's a number that I, I kind of internalized as an axiom, and I still use that number to this date. And we can actually look where that number comes from. And to understand that, we have to jump to the thing that shows up all the time on this channel, the hypergeometric calculator. Again, link for this is down below. You can find them on very easily on Google. But what this does is it calculates a hypergeometric distribution. What that is, is a way to calculate probabilities when sampling from a population without replacement. That's pretty technical, but we can use this very, very easily. And it's used all the time when trying to calculate odds of certain mulligans or drawing into certain cards when playing a card game. Inherently, card games are a very good use for a hypergeometric distribution. So say, for example, we're playing right now, we're playing in startup and we have a Padma deck. Our Padma deck is running the 45 cards and we want to find out how often we can have an opening hand in which our opening hand has a good enough economy play on turn one. So say for that, we're trying to draw into at least one copy of one of our economy options. May that be sure gamble, teller contract or uh, creative commission. 
We're running three copies of each because we can, so we're running nine successes in our population. Again, population is the deck size. Successes are the things that we're trying to draw into. We have nine options, and our sample size is how many cards we're drawing. Let's talk about just our opening hand. That's gonna be a five card hand. And we're trying to see the number of successes in our sample. That's how many of these cards we wanna draw in our opening hand. We're looking for at least one. Once you're ready to go, you hit calculate, and it's this number at the bottom that's the most important to understand. The cumulative probability of us having at least one or more successes in our five card hand is 70%, technically 69%. Nice. Now we can use this number at the bottom to have a good understanding of how likely we are to mulligan or to draw into an economy option in our opening hand. And of course, we can use this to start tweaking the numbers. Say we go instead and play a Dao deck, 40 cards. Now what's the chance of drawing into one of our economy options? 75%. What about if we wanna play 12 econ options? Now we're up to probably 85%. And this is a super useful tool to be able to get some sort of good probabilities surrounded by drawing cards from a deck, again, without replacement. Now we can use this hypergeometric distribution and sort of reverse engineer it to get some good ideas of how many axes a runner needs to steal seven points from just about any given deck. Let's start here. This is a startup deck, but specifically the reason we're looking at it is its agenda suite is really easy to use the hypergeometric with. We're running 10 agendas, but they're all two point agendas. This means for the runner, let alone for the corp to win this game, they're gonna have to steal or score four separate agendas. So we can take this data, it's a 49 card deck with 10 two point agendas, and we can slot it into the hypergeometric and kind of go backwards to see what our sample size needs to be to get four steals. So back at the hypergeometric, we know our population size. We have 10 successes in the population, those are all the agendas. We don't know the sample size, that's what we're trying to figure out, but the number of successes we need is we need to steal four of these agendas. So all we're trying to do here is we're gonna try and put numbers into the sample size to figure out when our cumulative probability of stealing four or more of these cards just hits 50%. So if we type in 16, that means if the runner sees 16 different cards from this deck, they have a 42% chance of winning the game. That's obviously a bit lower than we want, so we just increase this number. At 17, we're slightly below 50 at about a 48% chance. And then once we hit 18, we go exactly over to 54% chance which means that if the runner is running against this deck and accessing different cards, on average, they hit a 50% win rate on the 18th access. And that is largely where this number came from, the 17 to 18 accesses you need to win against any deck. Now, any deck is obviously an important thing that we're gonna spend the rest of this video talking about because different agenda distributions will actually produce different numbers. 18 is particularly quite good, honestly. Now, to understand in practical terms what we're doing here is all we're doing is this. We're shuffling the deck up and we're just drawing one card off the top of the deck over and over again until we see seven points of agendas. And it turns out that at least 50% of the time, that is gonna happen, 50% or more of the time, mind you, that is gonna happen on the 18th flip. On this case, we got it on 19. So that's what we're simulating. The runner's just seeing the top card of R&D over and over again without replacement until they just get the seven points. Technically, it's eight points for this agenda distribution. That's what makes it actually quite attractive. Now. The question stands, is that a good way to simulate Netrunner? And in some ways, yes, but obviously in a lot of ways, no. Hypergeometric distributions inherently are existing in a world without replacement. So the idea is that the runner is never gonna access the same card twice. That's inherently something that happens pretty often in Netrunner. Say we run R&D and see an Eli off the top, it goes to HQ, it's not installed, we run HQ, we see that Eli. Did that push us closer towards the number of accesses we need to win? According to the hypergeometric, no, practically slightly, but the hypergeometric is not counting that case whatsoever. We're basically saying any card we access is out of the game forever. Now, obviously that's not accurate how a game works. On top of that, if we run HQ, we can simply see the same card twice in a row. That doesn't really forward us in the hypergeometric. But I'd argue where the heuristic, the number we're getting from this sort of simulation of just hypergeometrically seeing what's ever on the top of the deck is still a very, very valuable number because it calculates how robust this deck is just to the single brute force access on R&D, on central servers in general. And you're gonna see some decks have a higher number than others. You're gonna see some decks have lower than others. And you're gonna see going forward that the most competitive decks generally in the standard and startup format have the highest numbers they can get to because that means it's just harder for the runner to get enough accesses in the game as a whole. But of course, there's some big assumptions about this. A lot of Netrunner games are won in less than 18 accesses in this case. And that's because in Netrunner, quantity of access is generally less desirable than quality of access. Say, for instance, it's turn three, turn four, and the corporation hasn't put a single agenda on the table, let alone they haven't shuffled anything back to their deck. That probably means there's a fair few agendas in HQ. They have to go somewhere. 
So the runner might make the first run of the entire game and they legwork HQ to see three cards. They steal two agendas. That means with these three axes, we're halfway towards winning. And that actually is very accurate of how competitive and high skill Neverner gets played. It's not so much about the qu quantity of axes, it's about the quality of axes. It's about reading board state and getting in when it matters. Again, the top of R&D might be full random. You might have some ideas of how many agendas are in there based off of how the game is going. But again, sometimes running HQ is the right call as long as it makes sense. Furthermore, if you know it's in the remote server, that's usually where the agendas go. So you could win a game by just running the remote server three times intelligently and winning. Take that 18 axes we won on three. So again, this heuristic of how robust the deck is to single axes is not gonna be the most representative overall about how many axes the runner actually needs, but it's a heuristic of how defensible the deck is to single axes, to axes in general uh, throughout the game, largely in central servers. So again, just to emphasize that, it's not the full story, but it's definitely a very important heuristic, and you're gonna see that the ways that you change your agenda distribution across all decks is gonna have very important changes to this number, and this number is very much worth looking into, albeit it's not the entire story. Say our deck has a very low number of accesses for the runner to hit 50%. There's other ways to deal with that, right? You could play defensive agendas. That has an impact on this. That's not gonna be observed in the number we're calculating. You could play better ice, where it's just harder to get more accesses. So maybe your deck is overall more defensible. Again, not gonna be observed in the number we're calculating. Also, if you're running a lot of smaller agendas or say a lot of trashables, it might actually be easier for the runner to see more new cards turn over turn. If they're running R&D and trashing or stealing, they can go deeper and see more cards. So while the number of accesses might be the same that we calculate, they might get to those number of accesses quickly. Again, if you're running very little ice, it's maybe easier for the runner to see enough cards. So do keep that in mind. This is not the entire story. But the heuristic that we're measuring off of this sort of um, hypergeometric is gonna give you an idea of how defensible your deck is, but it's not everything. And it's meant to be a guideline more, it is meant to be a hard rule. Okay, so understanding that caveat, how can we use this hypergeometric idea to calculate the, the agenda safety, the defensibility of different agenda suites? Because this deck specifically I chose because it's actually very easy to calculate. We're just running 10 two pointers. That's very easy to put into the hypergeometric. But as soon as we go to maybe some more practical cases, you find something like this deck, which is running three pointers, it's running a bunch of two pointers, it's running one pointers, let alone negative one pointers. That's inherently very difficult to run into a hypergeometric simulation. Now, originally what I was doing is I was running weighted hypergeometrics based off of the probability that the runner stole certain options of agendas, right? Like 40% of the time they steal a three pointer and two pointer. It gets really messy really fast. And it's actually very prone to make some simple math errors. And, and the nightmare case, pun intended of this deck, it's very difficult to do that because there's a lot of different possible outcomes of cards uh, that the runner is gonna steal or access. So what do we do? And I decided we can just leave the hypergeometric aside and do something that requires potentially a fair bit less math. And that is just simulate the ordeal. And that's where we end up today with the release here of our agenda density calculator. This thing just simulates the sort of game we played before, where we're just drawing cards off the top of the deck and keeping track of what the runner score is at any point. That means we can do any amount of three pointers and two pointers and not worry about hypergeometric math. Now, if we simulate that a lot of times, say like half a million times, and then look at the cumulative probability of winning on any axis, so the probability of winning on the 18th axis is the 18th plus the 17th plus the 16th and so forth, we'll get a number of axes in which the runner hits that 50 plus win rate. And it's pretty simple to use. We're gonna be talking about how to use it right now. There's a fairly rich feature set that you can do graphing and comparisons and you have a lot of little flags to, to change the mode. So we'll be talking here again, how it works. If you're not interested, jump to the results. We'll be getting there in just a moment. In short, how to get this running, you just need to download the Python script. It's just one simple Python file. To get that working, you're gonna to have to download Python. It's free. There's so many tutorials how to get this spun up on your computer. Highly recommend Python, a really nice language to, uh, to learn to code if you need to. And matplotlib also is a library you're gonna to have to install as well. It's also free, I believe open source, and we're using this for some of the graphing functionality. So once you grab those two, you're good to go. And in short, we have here uh, just a simple command line uh, program, a script that is really easy to use. So once you got this running, it's super simple to use. You just launch it from the command line and it's gonna walk you through and ask you basically about your deck. How many cards in your deck? We're playing 47 and it'll ask you now for the distribution of different points. We're gonna say we here, have here three two-pointers, six two-pointers, two one-pointers, for example. Now, if you mess this up and you write a deck that's technically illegal because you don't have enough points, it'll warn you, so no worries on that. 
And here it's gonna ask you a question, does your deck contain any copies of Global Food Initiative? This will show up as long as your deck has three pointers in it. For those who are not familiar, this is gonna be a very important talking point later on in this video, but there is a card in the standard format called Global Food Initiative, which looks like a three pointer, but functionally acts as a two pointer in the runner score area. This card is incredibly important. We'll be talking about it a fair bit, but it is gonna ask you if you're playing any Global Food Initiatives for obvious reasons, it impacts the simulation. Once you say yes or no here by Y or N, it asks you how many times would you like to run the test? Generally, I've been doing half a million to 600,000 on my simulations, and at that level, I found out that the results are pretty consistent. If you're running a lot of small agendas, a lot of negative agendas, like ridiculous amount of negative agendas, you probably wanna simulate a bit higher, maybe 700, 800,000. I don't really have a good reason why that is, but I found some variance when you have a lot of different ways things can work out. But most of the results I've been posting are 500 to 600,000. Once you hit enter, the simulation runs. On my machine, this takes about five to eight seconds. Your mileage may vary, but our results will be here shortly. And here we are. So it tells us what our deck is. It's a 49 card deck with 10 agendas of that distribution. Our agenda density is how many agendas we have per card. One agenda per 4.9 cards, a very important number. And then it tells you the runner reaches at least a 50% win rate by accessing 17 cards. And it'll tell you the distribution on how often the runner wins on a certain amount of steals, which is nice to know. And there you go, super simple to run. You can tweak with this to see what your deck can do. What happens when you add a three pointer into a list that didn't have any? Does it have a big impact on the deck? And you'll get the answers very quickly. Now there's a bunch of other modes that you can access that we're gonna run through really quickly here. And all these modes are basically hidden behind what I call argument flags. So if you put something like hyphen M for mad dash, it'll run a simple mad dash comparison. Mind you, all these flags are written on the readme file on the GitHub, but we'll be running through them right now. Hyphen M, we'll do a mad dash calculation. So we can write in the exact same deck, 262 for instance, no global food initiatives. And we're gonna run this again half a million times. And now it's actually gonna run two simulations. The first simulation will be the regular simulation we just saw before, but then it'll be doing a second simulation by playing Mad Dash. This is also really important to understand. Now, Mad Dash is an incredibly important card in the standard format right now. It's a neutral run event, so anyone can play it. And as long as this run event connects with stealing an agenda, you get an additional point in your score area. A lot of the best decks are playing Mad Dash for good reasons. And you'll see the results we're gonna talk about really support that claim. Uh, the way that we simulate Mad Dash, we're just playing to six points. We're assuming every single mad dash that we simulate, the runner gets a mad dash off in every single game in a way that actually matters. And that is a fair bit generous to some of the runner decks. So you have to understand that our mad dash data is slightly inflated. That being said, I do think the most competitive lists that are playing mad dash are mad dashing as consistently as they can because they build their decks around it. But do keep that in mind. Our mad dash number just hits six points and always works. On that note too, there are technically zero point agendas that exist in Netrunner. Um, we're not using those, the simulation actually doesn't even take those at all. And those technically interact with Mad Dash, but those are not really a thing in that you have to worry about. So we ignored that. And here we go. So now we're gonna get actually a comparison here. The top is just the normal deck without Mad Dash, 17 axes as we saw. And then the bottom, if the runner is playing Mad Dash into the same deck, it drops down to 14 axes. And so now the Mad Dash is quote unquote worth three extra axes. This Mad Dash ability we'll be talking about when we talk about the results, but it's really important to understand how your deck holds up to Mad Dash if you're expecting Mad Dash in the standard competitive format. And let me tell you, I think you are. Alternately, another flag, and it's worth knowing you can use these flags together. You can stick just about as many as you want on a single thing and it'll work. The order doesn't really matter. Hyphen N just allows you to include negative points into your simulation. So let's do again 49, 262, and then how many negative one point agenda cards we add to our deck, it asks here, and then we'll run the simulation off that. Let's just put three, no foods, run that half a million. Important to understand how we simulate negative points is again, in a very naive way. There are cards in Netrunner that the runner can add to the score area as negative one agenda points, putting them back from the seven points they need. Now, our simulation is just going to assume every negative one agenda point the runner accesses, they're gonna take as negative one agenda points. That's not always true. Now, decks are gonna go out of the way to make the decision either as easy as possible or as difficult as possible, depending on how you look on it. But we're gonna, again, assume that just all the negative points are stolen by the runner when they see them. So you have to keep that in mind that our negative point uh, scores are gonna be a bit inflated because the runner is just gonna end up with negative points. In theory, you can take a news team as two tags as much as that doesn't happen often. And then seeing our results here, you're gonna see with the negative points as well, we go up to 19 accesses. So adding three negative ones to this deck, if they're consistently firing and you can build your deck so that's a, the case, we actually add two more accesses and that's pretty impactful. We'll talk about that when we get to the results. 
Other flags you can add, you can add hyphen L, and this is actually very similar to Mad Dash. It just, we're playing to six points. That's a limited mode flag. That's really important for folks who like to play draft or, or uh, any other limited format where you generally play to six agendas. So you can use that if you'd like. And also you have hyphen DO for deck override, which just uh, doesn't do checks, whether your deck is a legal construction. So you can see ridiculous cases, and this is actually useful to see the impact of certain things where we can put like 12 three pointers in, uh, in a deck and it, it's just gonna fire it. It doesn't care. Seven axes. Wow. Yeah. Great. Next up, we're going to be talking about some of the plotting we can do. There's two things we can plot as outputs in here. We can plot win rate and we can plot the number of axes required to win across simulations. And I think these are fascinating if you want to learn a bit more about uh, deck construction. So for instance, if we do hyphen P to plot and then we do hyphen WR, so hyphen plot win rate, uh, we can run a deck and it'll give us a plot that shows us basically the runner's win rate across axes. So we just type in our normal deck as we do. And not only will we get the textual output we're expecting, we'll also get this matplotlib graph. Resizing this up, this is the probability, the runner's probability of winning across axes across all half a million simulations we simulated. So up here, it says that we reached the at least 50% plus win rate at 17 axes. Our win rate there is 55%. And this graph is really interesting because looking at it, you can see the slope of the line and the slope of the line will tell you how much an additional axis is worth at any point. At this point, if I'm not mistaken, it looks like every single additional axis is about worth 5% win rate. That's a really fascinating number to understand that your 18th axis gives you up to 55%. Your 19th axis gets you to 60%. At that point, those axes actually seem quite valuable. Now, obviously, they taper at the ends, but this is really interesting to see. Certain decks have a sharper or a less sharp slope based off of composition. Generally, negative agenda point decks will have this, uh, the less sharp slope because the more axes you get, the more likely you're also to find negative points. Now this graph on its own is interesting, but very important to understand that the script too allows you to do comparisons with or without plotting as well. So for instance, let's go back here and let's say we wanna look at the, the impact of something like Global Food Initiative. So we're gonna do, and we're gonna plot the win rate, but we're also gonna do hyphen C to do a single comparison. And now we're gonna input two decks one at a time. Our first deck is gonna be the, the classic Global Food Initiative deck, two three-pointers, seven two-pointers, no one-pointers, and we're playing two Global Food Initiatives. We're not gonna simulate Mad Dash, it will ask you, and then we're gonna run that half a million times. Once that simulates, it'll ask us to input a second deck. And there you go, our second deck is gonna be very similar. We're running 49 cards, three two-pointers, seven two-pointers, no one-pointers, but this time we're running no global food initiatives, and you'll see the difference this makes. It'll simulate that again the same amount of times, and we're gonna see the results compared in text, but also on that graph. First, looking at the graph, you see the red is the non-GFI version and the blue is the Global Food Initiative version. The blue one requires you 20 axes to hit the 50% mark. Now the slopes are kind of similar, you about a 5% per axis at once you get to that midpoint, but you see the big difference here of the quality of Global Food Initiative, what it can do for the runner, and it makes things really difficult when you're playing it. If you close the graph, you go back to the textual output, you do see the comparisons here, deck one versus deck two, and it says deck one requires three more axes for the runner to steal a 50% win rate. So taking the exact same deck and just spending two influence and changing a three-pointer to kind of a pseudo-blank three-pointer, getting three more axes is required to win is actually a huge amount. That is significant. Now, similarly to this, you can do a triple comparison, which will be hyphen CC. You can still plot win rate or what have you, and that will compare three different decks on the same graph, which is super useful. You can also plot axes, which is kind of nice as well. I'm going to run this again twice with the same two decks that we're looking at. Now this is the number of axes required to win across all the simulations. So you see there are some amount of times where the runner wins on very few axes, but on average you're hitting that 20 to 17 axis. Technically, I think the high point of this distribution is slightly less than the number here, but generally these distributions tend to be a bit tail weighted. So the actual probability of hitting 50% cumulatively is slightly to the right of that point. But this is a nice visualization where you can compare two and even three, mind you, if you do a triple comparison hyphen CC uh, to see some results. Very interesting stuff, and again, it does still give you the textual results there. And that is the script, very simple to use. Again, you have a bunch of those arguments, you can find more about this on the readme, but you can get basically any result you want to and see what simple changes to your deck, compare them, double compare them, compare them against Mad Dash, and uh, this is a very fun tool if you wanna make some small changes and see, again, see what those small changes can potentially have a really big impact. And that being said, Let's get to the numbers. So these are the output numbers that we're sharing from the agenda density chart up. We have we have a Google sheet here, and this should have numbers that we automated using the script for basically every single distribution of agenda points that you're gonna reasonably see within the formats. 
Now, I do want to say that these numbers will calculate it at around half a million, sometimes 600,000 simulations. So they should be relatively accurate. But do watch out. I think in the extreme cases where we add like negative 12 agendas as a joke to see what that looks like, these numbers might be a bit more volatile. I do think you probably have to simulate a bit higher here, but I'm not that worried about that. Those numbers are not very useful. And we're going to start here on the left. This is the startup fast sheet and startup is actually really fascinating. I'll be honest, I started making this video because I wanted to talk about the difference between agenda suites and startup and standard. Because when I played startup, it felt like the agenda suites and startup were a bit more fair. It seemed like on average, the runner was winning on more accesses. And I largely thought that was because of the amount of agendas or the kinds of agendas that startup is limited by. And that's really important to understand when looking at startup. Startup right now, mind you, we are in uh, the Borealis startup. Uh, Parhelion just came out. Uh, there's not that many agendas in startup. And just the amount of agendas is going to greatly restrict the sort of agenda distributions and agenda makeups you can get in any deck. And that, again, is a numbers thing. In terms of one pointers, the most you can put in a single deck is 12 one pointers if you're playing Jinteki, which I don't think that's really a realistic thing you want to do, maybe outside of personal evolution. In two pointers, you basically have all you want. I think Wayland has the most by a mile, but there's no deck that's starved for two pointers if they want them. But this is the most important part, three pointers. There's only a single three pointer you can play in startup right now which means that there is no startup deck that can run more than three three-point agendas. And that is going to inherently have a huge restriction on the amount of different agenda suites you can have in startup. And you're going to see in the data across the rest of this video that three-pointers have a huge impact on some of the more extreme cases you can build into when building agenda suites into the standard format. Obviously, Global Food Initiative, it's its own thing, but just having more three-pointers, having a deck with six or seven three-pointers is very interesting. So going back to startup, we have very few agenda suites. It's worth noting that we do have full sheets we'll be looking at for startup that have all the data, but almost all the data is here on the fast sheet. And I thought this was just an interesting way to display the minimal amount of data in startup. So how this works, let's look at the top one here. Mind you, this is a chart for 49 deck size in startup, and it is a triple axis graph. Firstly, I've never really done a triple axis graph. This is the way I did it. If there's a better way to display it, let me know. But if you want to look up any agenda distribution, you start here on the left to get how many three-point agendas in your deck. Let's say we have one three-point agenda. Then you slide to the top column to find how many two-point agendas you have. Say we have six. And so we're trying to look at one of these two numbers here. Either do we have five one-pointers or six one-pointers? And whichever one we choose, the number of accesses the runner requires to hit that 50% win rate is the number here on in the orange, on the right of the number you're looking at. So for five, it's 17. For six, it's 16. Same here for the 44-card deck. And that's it. Because there's only this many ways to build decks in startup, it's actually pretty reasonable. You can show it on one frame just like this. But you might be noticing something strange here, especially if we focus on the 49. There's not a lot of different numbers there. Startup is super flat. I was really surprised to see this. There's like only two reasonable agenda densities in startup in terms of the amount of accesses the runner needs. Firstly, we have this outlier here, 18. That's the one we started this video with. This is the agenda suite where we run only two pointers. And uh, it's an interesting agenda suite. It has some downsides. We'll get back to it. But largely, everything else is 17 or 16. And actually, the columns that have 16 in it can largely be discarded. It's important to know that when you're building a Netrunner deck, you're required, based on your deck size, how many agendas you want to run. If you're running a 45 to 49 card deck, you're required 20 to 21 agenda points. Largely, people believe that you should be running the bottom end of that because that means you have fewer agenda points in your deck, which means it's harder for the runner to win off central servers. And do you see the math here? That holds out. All of these 16s are the versions of the deck that are running 21 agenda points. So just running one additional point in your deck lowers the amount of accesses the runner requires from 17 to 16. So if you can, you should go out of your way not to play that because 16 is lower number, lower number is bad. Now here is a part that I was struggling with for a while. It might be hard to understand what is the actual impact of running a 16 axis deck versus a 17 axis deck. The runner being required to get one fewer or one more access might not seem like a big deal. Maybe that's the difference of a turn. Maybe that just means they have to jailbreak slightly harder. Who knows? So what does it actually work out to? Is there a really big punishment to running 21 versus 20 points in startup? And I think this is one way that we can maybe show the difference. Let's look at this here. This is the one eight two. So one three pointer. Uh, eight two-pointers and two one-pointers. It requires 16 accesses. And we can run this in the simulation using the deck override feature so we no longer check for legal decks. And at the top there, deck one is exactly the deck we're calculating. Based off of what we expected, they win on 16 accesses 50% more of the time, exactly what the chart behind it says. But what about if we take the exact same deck and the only thing we change is that we forget to take a two-pointer out of our deck box. So we are now obviously playing an illegal deck but having in a deck that has just literally one fewer agenda for the runner to possibly steal, we hit 17 accesses. 
So if you feel that the idea that the runner has left a two pointer in their deck box and that's inherently very unfair because it's harder to win the game, you're right, it is. But the difference was just that one more access. And that's kind of the value there. It's trying to win the game as if it had one fewer agenda in the deck based off of this specific agenda distribution. I think that might be a good example of what the difference between 16 and 17 can be. Playing against a deck with one fewer agenda than legal might feel like a pretty bad uh, disadvantage. And that's kind of what you're doing to yourself if you're playing 21 versus 20 points. Again, a certain agenda densities might not be affected that difficult, but the 1A2 example, you do get there. Similarly, on a different angle, we've simulated these decks again. Deck one is the deck we're looking at, 16 axes on a 1A2. What else can we do to that deck to make it a 17 axis deck? And it turns out we can just add five non agenda cards. We can play an illegal 54 card deck and we will hit that 17 access number. So again, if you don't think one additional access on this sort of heuristic is important, that is the difference between playing with a corp deck that has five extra non-agenda cards in it. Again, that's gonna have an impact on the corp as much as it is gonna have an impact on the runner, but if that seems unfair, that is the sort of difference five additional non-agenda cards uh, contribute to this sort of deck. One more access can be a lot. Cool. Now, going back to the data, you'll notice the big surprise here about startup is that largely outside of the 1716, that's all you can do. Everything else is really, really quite flat. Now, 18 is something you can get to in startup. Either playing 10 two pointers in a 49 or actually nine two pointers in a 44 will get you there. And that's the best you can do. But again, keep in mind, this heuristic is not the entire story because you might see practically as soon as you sleeve up the stack that you're also in a kind of an ugly spot as a corporation. As a corporation, while the runner is required to steal four agendas, you're also required to score four agendas, which might be more difficult than you want. Now, I do think this is an agenda suite that's worth pursuing in startup. Maybe you want to go out of your way to play Project Beal, specifically in NBN, because you can score this out like a pseudo three pointer, kind of like a global food initiative, and that might make it a reasonable agenda suite. Or on top of that, if you get some tags going on, you can play backroom machinations, and that's the way you close the game. Score a bunch of two pointers and score out. So again, while the heuristics here are super useful, you have to watch out for practical cases in which um, some of these agenda suites are just actually harder to play than others. Now, there is one number that does stick out from startup, and that's this one here. If you play 44 card deck and you play three three pointers and five two pointers and no one pointers, you get 15 accesses. It's just bad. Um, I don't have anything smart to say about it. Besides, that is the one outlier in all of startup. You are playing 19 agenda points, if I'm not mistaken. So you're playing more than you need to. And then you're running a lot of three pointers. So there's just a lot of cases where the runner wins on three axes. So it's bad. Just try and avoid that. But if you avoid that, you're pretty good in startup. Regardless, startup is super flat. And that's the thing I've been really excited about in startup is that almost no matter what you do, your gameplay is going to be consistent across everything. Again, the difference between 18, 17, and 16 is actually pretty large, but largely should be, again, no reason that you're playing 16 if you can avoid it. And that's cool. That's actually really cool for startup. And I think it explains a bit of my feelings about how I've been feeling that most startup corp decks, the agendas were not that hard to find compared to some of the extreme cases you can do in standard format with, again, maybe more defensible agendas, let alone you can play fewer agendas if you're playing more three pointers, let alone global food initiatives. So that's really cool. Now here at the bottom. We have a chart too that's a bit interesting if you'd like. It's basically the same as the two charts on the top, just a bit spread out, because in each pocket, instead of having one option, we have two options. And then each of these options is attached to a single drop down menu, so you can do some quick comparisons. The top in green regular, that is what is displayed up here on the chart. Maybe the greens should not be green, maybe this should be orange. But then the second number next to it is controlled by this drop down. So you can see what the difference is of adding a single negative one agenda point to your deck. It does in terms of the number of axes is required up to two all the way up to three, which is the most negative points you can add into the startup format. This is interesting as a whole. You'll notice certain agenda suites are impacted more by negative points. This 18 goes only up to a 19, and that makes sense if you look at how the runner is going to score out. But otherwise, across the board in startup. If you can add three nightmare archives to your deck and make it so the runner actually does want to take these as negative points, which mostly is a Thule thing or an HB thing in general, because they're worried about the core damage, you actually add, you can go all the way up to 19 accesses, which makes it the hardest deck to steal in startup. And that actually is probably worth pursuing. I think there's some really good reasons to pursue that. But again, on average, adding all the negative points you can to a startup deck increases those accesses by two. And for folks who want to see this data in a different sheet, we have it here. I think this sheet does have a couple extra things that are worth looking at. Firstly, we have this color coding. In any column, the darker the color it is, generally the best in class it is. And the, if there's no color, if it's just pure, pure white, that's generally the worst in class you can get to. 
So for instance, on the left here, that's all the different agenda distributions and next to is the number of accesses. Here we have that 18, uh, which is the best you can get to. And then here on the right, we have the agenda per card column, which I think you really need to keep in mind as much as it's not referenced on the, the previous fast sheet. Now this number is incredibly important. In this agenda suite, where we have 10 agendas across 49 cards, that means we have one agenda per 4.9 cards. I'm not sure if this should be cards per agenda or agendas per card. It always feels backwards whenever I say it out loud. When I teach Netrunner, this is a number that I think all runners should really keep in mind. And I generally say, when you're playing against a corporation, the corporation is going to be drawing one agenda in every five cards. That's really important. Again, say it's turn three and the corporation has drawn at least 10 cards and there's nothing on the table, nothing scored out, nothing shuffled back. That means they probably have two agendas in HQ. So if you're considering spending a couple credits to get an HQ run, this is a really good time to do it. And again, we just get to this math by dividing the number of cards the corp draws by five. But besides these ridiculous cases where the corporation is playing basically all the one pointers they can in the format, the decks you're expecting to see in startup, it's about one agenda in five cards, sometimes slightly above that, sometimes slightly lower. Now, this number doesn't get better than, I think, 5.44 across all of startup. And that's largely because you have to run a certain amount of agendas in any deck because we only have so many three pointers that we can use. The more three pointers you have in the format, the larger that number can get because three pointers take up less deck slots, yet give you enough points to hit your agenda point threshold. So that's really also important to understand is that that number across all of startup generally doesn't go higher than 5.5. So if you keep that number in mind, one agenda in every five cards across all of startup, you're in a really, really good spot. This changes heavily when we get to standard, but for startup, that very good. Again, across all of startup, it's pretty flat. No matter what you're doing, one in five, no matter what you're doing, about 17 axes is what you need. And I kind of love that for startup. It's, it's really cool. Now, this number two is also worth understanding for a corporation. The higher this number it is, it means the less slots in your deck that are uh, forced to be agendas, which means you can inherently put more cards into your deck that are non-agendas. May that be economy, may that be defensive upgrades, ice, obviously all the other cool stuff in your deck. So there are some huge advantages to having a really high number here because you just have more deck slots to work with. And that's one of the wild things here is understanding that you can put three three pointers in your startup deck does not ridiculously tank the number of axes the runner requires to win. And that's something that I was kind of expecting going into all of this math. So keep that in mind. I think running a single send a message in just about any corp deck in startup kind of makes sense. So again, there'll be some games where it feels bad where you lose it, but on average, it works out relatively well. Otherwise, here behind my head, you see the negative maths about adding certain negative points, and we have the negative effect. That's basically what the change is to the amount of axes required. And you see here by adding all three negatives, the most you're going to add is two axes, which is pretty good. When you go to startup 44, there are some cases where it adds three axes, but that's generally on some of the worst options. So again, don't play the 350 in 44 startup. It's, it's specifically the worst thing you can do in startup. Also, I wanted to look at startup 54. Mind you, we have a minimum deck size. We don't have a maximum deck size. And playing 54 cards, which requires us to have 22 to 23 agenda points, is not probably worth pursuing. None of these numbers are that different than you'd expect by playing 44 or 49. Uh, yeah, just across the board, we're, we're jumping between 16 and 17. So we have that 118 if we play only two pointers, but the agenda per card isn't great. The number of axes doesn't change. So you're just making your deck less consistent while having no real benefit for that whatsoever. Unless I guess you're worried about being milled out for some reason. How much do you not like Essa? And that's startup. And I'm actually really excited to see how flat it is and how fair it feels across the board. There are no really wild extremes, no really sharp edges you have to worry about. Just kind of play the minimum agenda requirement that you can on any corp deck and you're going to be in a pretty good spot. In fact, almost as good as it can be. But now let's jump to standard and standard has some really wild things. There's actually two specific things that impact these numbers greatly. And you're going to see way more extreme uh, options than you are going to in startup. There's two things specifically I want to focus on. And the first is something that we mentioned in startup. Startup has a smaller card pool. So there is no corp deck that can run more than three three pointers. Standard has a way bigger card pool. So just about any deck can run as many three pointers as they really put their mind to. Mind you, some of these cards are banned, but the basic idea is that you're going to see decks that are running as few agendas as they can because they can just run all the three pointers. And that's where we get to some really extreme cases. So let's look here on the left. The amount of three pointers, if we go all the way to the bottom, mind you, there's way more agenda options here in startup. You see these sort of options. This deck here is running as few agendas as you can in a 49 card deck. It's running six three pointers and a single two pointer. So that's only seven agendas in a 49 card. And now where we're looking at one agenda per five cards, largely in startup, we're at one per seven. That's a massive difference, let alone, of course, here, the number of axes required is 18. 
That is largely the highest you could do in a very specific case in, in a startup that's very common in standard. Inherently in standard, you're finding decks that are getting 18 plus almost all the time. So the amount of accesses you need, and again, there's more tools to get more quality accesses for sure, but it is just generally higher. The agendas can be harder to find. But this number here, seven, is really quite powerful. And it's actually one of the big contributors to these sort of decks that can use agendas as not their primary win condition. By only having one agenda per seven cards, that means we have overall way more cards in the deck that we can uh, slot into other ways that we're attacking runners. For instance, this is a very strong card. It's still legal in startup, was recently banned in standard, but the sort of Drago decks that we've saw over the last competitive season across continentals and into worlds are decks that are not excited to score agendas and are running as few as possible, so they have as many slots as they can to play non-agenda cards. So this sort of deck needs to play Drago, it needs to play Tag Punishment, uh, and you just have so many more slots to be able to do this thing. So again, the agendas are harder to find, yet alone you have more slots to do more punishment stuff. You also see this, of course, in acid-based strategies. Now you just have way more slots to work with to play more assets and more kill combos and just fewer agendas. This is something that's inherent to standard that you can't do in startup because you can lower your deck to only holding seven agendas. This is the wild case, mind you. This is the deck that's largely swept through Continentals, this sort of NBN Drago deck. Mind you, multiple parts of this have been banned out for now, but you are seeing lists like this all through the competitive season of at the end of last year. It's a 44 card deck, which we only have to play six agendas. Six three points gets you to 18. And looking at the chart, the numbers on this thing are absolutely ridiculous. Jumping over the standard 44 at the bottom, we see here we're looking at 19 required accesses to have a 50% plus win rate, and we're looking at one agenda in 7.33 cards. That's basically the highest you can do in the entire standard format, at least for the agendas per card, and 19 is no slouch. Better than anything you can do in the whole startup format. But then, on top of that, a very big difference between this and startup as well is that these are defensive agendas. So these agendas are just inherently harder to steal at any point in time. Which means inherently, if you end up going tag me in this sort of matchup early on, and you want to just close the game by getting enough accesses to win, it's very, very difficult. Defensive agendas, let alone the fewest amount you can run, let alone in this sort of a deck, 19 agendas, 7.33, that's a nightmare situation. And this is one of the big differences between standard and startup. Again, I think still standard is great. This is not meant to be a video about why standard is not great. Uh, standard's great. Is that you are gonna see more extreme cases and there's some very good reasons why corporations wanna play as few agendas and they can get away with much more ridiculous numbers than in startup. That's one thing that's notable in startup. The second thing, of course, is our friend here, Global Food Initiative. This is also gonna be one of the most important cards that has massive impacts on some of the decks we're looking at. Global Food Initiative on its own is a 5-3 neutral agenda, so any corporation can play it. It is worth one influence, so you do have to spend influence, and for that influence, you get a card that's text says, this counts as a two-pointer for the runner. So if you're running, say, three Global Food Initiatives in your deck, while this is technically a blank agenda in terms of proactive scoring strategy, but now the runner's trying to steal seven points of agenda from a corporation deck that functionally only has 17 points in it instead of the 20 to 21 you're expecting in a 49 card deck. That obviously is gonna have huge impact on, the, on these numbers. Specifically, this card has been competitive as basically as soon as it came out. All the way back to 2015 World Champion, this is an agenda suite that's very, very notable. It's running two Global Food Initiatives, and we're gonna largely count this as a two-pointer, and then just running seven other two-pointers. So we're in that same situation where we started the video, a deck that's very easy to do a hypergeometric distribution where all we're running is two pointers. The runner needs to steal four of the nine cards in our deck. And the numbers on this are absurd. If you go to standard 49, you'll notice there's a column here on its own for global food initiatives because it's that important. And if you scroll down here to the 43, zero, two foods, seven, two pointers, zero pointers, we're looking at 20. That dark green number means that this is the highest in class. You can never get more than 20, and we still have a very respectable 5.44 agendas per card. Also, compared to the just running a bunch of two-pointers, this is really good for the corporation because inherently they can win by scoring three agendas. Food is still a real three-pointer for them, but not for the runner. This is wild. And you're gonna notice these color trends. Anytime that you start adding global food initiatives, these things, they just get darker. Slightly darker, two foods, way darker, three foods, the darkest you can go and then no foods, and then the cycle repeats. Basically, the more foods you put in your deck, as a rule, all these numbers that we care about just inherently go up. Global Food Initiative does a lot. Now again, to try to put that in perspective of how powerful Global Food Initiative is, if we look at this version here of 270, requires 20 axes, we can see what we would have to do to a regular standard deck that is running that same distribution of three pointers to two pointers, but is running no Global Food Initiatives, running functional, otherwise three pointers. And the numbers look like this. 
We can run the simulation here. The deck one, mind you, is the two GFIs and seven twos, which again, 20 axes is. And the bottom deck is the exact same deck. But mind you, we've done the deck override function, so it's not a legal deck anymore. But it's running 11 additional non-agenda cards. With 11 additional non-agenda cards, we're running 60 cards in the deck and we're running two non-GFI three-pointers and seven two-pointers, and then we hit 20 axes. Yeah, that's a lot. Imagine trying to win a game against a corporation that has shuffled 11 additional cards into their deck. Now, of course, that's gonna have an impact to the corporation as well, but that is kind of a good representation of how much more difficult it can be to get enough accesses to win the game, again, off of largely central servers. So keep that in mind, that's huge. Alternately, if you take that same deck of 49 cards and say the corporation just left a three-point agenda in their deck box, that deck alone, you still require 19 accesses to win. So it's actually easier to win against that deck a lot of times than something that has global food initiatives. It's pretty wild. Global Food Initiative is immensely powerful, and it's a card that's definitely worth keeping in mind when you're doing just about any deck building. As non exciting as a pseudo blank 5 3 is, it really increases the length of the game if you're worried about losing to accesses off central servers. So it is a card that, mind you, is going to be rotating just in a couple months this summer. So maybe its time has come to an end, but ridiculously powerful. Now, the last thing we need to look at, because it is one of the big equalizers to some of these most ridiculous extremes when it comes to standard, is the great equalizer, Mad Dash. Mad Dash is a neutral run event. Anybody can play this, no influence, and you make a run. And if you stole an agenda during that run, you get a, a Mad Dash as a point in your score area. Our simulation simulates Mad Dash. It simulates it in a very naive way. It just makes sure that any deck that's running Mad Dash gets Mad Dash to consistently land. But you'll see that in our results, basically any deck that's incredibly strong into any runner that requires a lot of accesses to hit that 50% win rate, Mad Dash it hits back almost in that equally extreme way. And this is something that competitive Netrunner players have been realizing for a long time going forward. This card is absurd, specifically into a meta where corporations are building agenda suites that are inherently very difficult to interact with. If we look at the top eight from Worlds last year, I believe six of the eight decks are all running not only one copy of Mad Dash, some of them are running two because it turns out to be one of the most important cards when you're running into that 44 card deck with six agendas in it. Again, you can close the game really quickly. Everyone's playing it. Everyone's playing it. And you can see the results here. We have them in our, in our sheet. That is this column here, accesses with Mad Dash. So again, very naively, this is very generous to the Mad Dash runner. We're assuming every runner can land a Mad Dash in every game that matters. And I do think some of the more competitive decks are basically at that point. This sort of deck that requires 20 accesses, as soon as you Mad Dash it, it goes down to 14. That's pretty low. And this number here, the dash ability, is basically how many accesses the mad dash shaves off of the required accesses without mad dashing. And this white box means that that is the worst number for the corporation you could expect. And that is largely a result of building an agenda suite that's inherently very unfair uh, to the runner is usually incredibly fair to the runner. In fact, it's a huge detriment for the corporation if they are playing mad dash. And that's why you're seeing mad dash all over top tables. And it's one of the most important cards. If you can look at Mad Dash in this extreme case and realize that this Mad Dash is worth six extra axes in a game, makes it, in some ways, the most powerful multi-axis card, again, as long as your deck can consistently fire it. I think the most extreme case is if we look at that standard 44 card deck we're looking at before, that six three-point agenda, that's sort of like Reality Plus deck, seven. It's worth seven axes in that matchup is incredibly extreme. So if you find yourself struggling against a lot of these decks that are inherently running ridiculous numbers on both sides of this table, that is the great equalizer, Mad Dash. Now, the cool thing as a core player you can glean from looking at these numbers is understanding that there are actually agenda suites that you don't often see at top tables that are the best of both worlds. You can have a deck that has a really good number of axes and agenda per cards, but also doesn't lose very heavily to Mad Dash. And funny enough, one of the big reasons is Global Food Initiative. You don't see this a lot, but check this out. So say we're playing at 44 and we need to run six agendas. What about if we ran three three-pointers and then three global food initiatives? That gives us a 19 required accesses. It's pretty high. We're still on that beautiful 7.33 best in class, but our mad dash ability is down to 18. Dash ability is only one. That's kind of the best you can ask for in the entire format. And the big reason is that global food initiative works really well into mad dash. I've seen people suggest before decks that combine three pointers and global food initiatives. And I've always kind of thought that that was not a very good thing to be doing with your influence. Inherently, including global food initiatives into decks of only three pointers, the text on global food initiative matters only in the very narrow case where the runner steals every single global food initiative in the deck. 
Otherwise, they're going to win on three axes no matter what. If they steal all global food initiatives, that brings them to six, so they require a fourth axis, but that happens frighteningly few times. So why do it? And the reason is Global Food Initiative is sick into Mad Dash. You're no longer losing to two axes with Mad Dash all that consistently. Now, of course, there is a big trade off here. This is not the most obvious change because, again, in these sort of decks, these agendas are actually defensible. They have abilities that are harder to steal than Global Food Initiatives. But I'd argue that looking at these sort of things, again, that is a ridiculously good dash ability. And if you're trying to play this agenda suite into a meta where you can expect every top runner to play Mad Dash, you should be looking at this sort of thing. Another very interesting thing to look at is just playing a bit more one pointers. No Signal Games has been printing these one, two point agendas, one point agendas you can score from hand and that actually have relevant abilities. And I think they actually contribute to a lot of these agenda suites in kind of nice ways. If we jump over to that 49 and look at that global food initiative 020, we can actually build an agenda suite that's similar to that, but without having a massively bad mad dash ability. So say that we want to play something like two foods and then six two pointers and then two elevagaos, maybe in that HB deck. Our number of accesses goes down to 18, but our dash ability goes to 16. That's actually not that bad considering how bad 14 is. Maybe that's a reasonable enough trade while still having an agenda suite that can very reasonably score out to seven points. Again, if you want to look further down the chart and play three global food initiatives with two pointers and then three one pointers, you get to 19 and 17 on my dash, which is not bad whatsoever. There's even versions of this that uh, mix one pointers with global food initiatives and you get pretty reasonable numbers as well. Down here with one real three pointer, some foods, some two pointers and some one pointers, you get 19 and 17. Again, you have to figure out how easy this deck scores to seven points, whether it's worth the trade off, whether your cards per slot goes up or down. 5.4 is pretty fair, but I do think there's some ways that you can use this to your advantage to play against the Mad Dash decks that I think you're reasonably expecting at top tables for a while to come. Otherwise, in standard, barring those two extremes of playing a lot of three pointers and playing global food initiative, you're seeing results that are of course, very similar to startup. You're bouncing between 17 and 16 largely based off of whether you're playing the maximum agenda points or the minimum agenda points required. And again, you generally want to play the minimum. That 16 to 17 jump is actually pretty considerable. But lastly, here behind my head, we have some columns talking about negative agenda points. And of course, our simulation says the runner just eats every single negative point they, they run into. So do keep that in mind. It's a bit generous. But negative agenda points are actually a pretty reasonable way to combat some of the downsides that Mad Dash can cause. So say here we go to that classic 2015 special of the two food seven two pointers with Mad Dash, we're looking at 14 axes. But if say for some reason you can make that deck make sense by running some negative points and we go over here to three negative ones, we're looking at 21 axes without Mad Dash, but that Mad Dash ability is actually impacted very heavily by negative points. Again, negative points interact well, they basically cancel out the Mad Dash and that Mad Dash is it seems to be the most important thing against these agenda densities. So I do think there's some very good reasons to want to consider putting negative points as long as they're consistent and make sense with your game plan if you're playing into Mad Dash. And that's the data. You can look at this again. You can see the dash ability and the negative effect, how many more are adding this amount of negative points to your deck requires. And I think some of these are very attractive as much as you have to make the negative points uh, be worth pursuing and actually make sense with your overarching game plan in your deck. Finally, last thing we want to go over, we did do some simulations to see what happens when you play a 45 card minimum deck or a 40 minimum card deck. Again, the basic best practice that's always taught in Netrunner is that if you have a 45 card deck, you want to play 49 cards. That is the most non agendas you can add to your deck without uh, going over to the next threshold of how many agenda points you have to play. And the numbers do greatly support that. If we're playing, say, a 40 card deck instead of a 44, uh, basically all the number of accesses the runner requires to win the game go down by two. That's significant. We gain no noticeable benefit besides maybe your agenda per card goes down if you really want to find your agendas quickly. But I don't think that's worth doing. I think there's not enough card draw and filtering that you can play in your corp deck that going from a 17 to a 15 is, again, one of the worst things you can do. This is for 40. This is for 45. It's no difference. Everything just goes down is a pretty bad thing to do if you want to not lose off central service. Additionally, we have two columns for 54 and 59, which are bigger deck sizes you can build than you need to. And just like in startup, there's not a really good incentive to build into 54 and 59. Your deck is less consistent and the numbers are not that much more favorable, if at all. 59 I was most interested about because 59 requires you to run 24 to 25 agenda points. Any number that's divisible by three gets a uh, uh, it works really well if you're running only three pointers. So all the way at the bottom here, you can run just eight three pointers and you get 19 required accesses, which is really good, but not something you can't get in other agenda sizes. And you get 7.38, which is slightly better than the 7.3 or whatever your seven you can get in 44 and 49. But 
almost definitely not worth pursuing 10 additional cards to make your deck less consistent. So you can look at these numbers if you like, but the numbers do not support building a bigger deck in any meaningful way. The results, yeah, it, it just doesn't look really good. And that's it. This is all the data we've been working on for a couple weeks now. Of course, I need to emphasize this one last time at the end of the video is that our simulation makes a lot of assumptions. Our methodology is not an exact science because of course it's very difficult to simulate Netrunner. But if you understand the shortcomings, this is still a very good heuristic to understand how robust certain agenda suites are on accesses on specifically central servers. This is a number that is really important. And you're gonna see all the best decks over the last couple of years generally have really good numbers in one or all categories on this page. And it's up to you as a runner or a corp deck builder to understand that there's ways to use these to your advantage. Are we playing into mad dash? Are we playing into negative points? What can we do to make a deck that's more resilient across the whole field? And that being said, of course, a lot of time has gone into this video. Very excited to finally get this out. But if you appreciated any part of this, if you want to like this video, leave a comment, specifically what you've learned from this video in a comment. I'd be very ex excited to learn. But it, liking that, subscribing to the channel or sharing this to your friend is, uh, it makes the biggest difference on getting this channel to grow. And that's it. Enjoy some deck building. Good luck on your central servers. Woo! Thanks so much for watching that. Hopefully you found that to be at least somewhat useful. We've been working on this clearly for a while now. It's been a couple weeks. So I need to give some huge shout outs to a lot of people along the way that helped make this happen. Firstly, to Yasengrin, who was kind enough to do some simulation on his side and double check my work. Greatly appreciated. Got to give some huge shout outs to some nice patrons and some nice folks who responded in some of the comments, when, specifically at points where we're kind of stuck with the math. Ruben, Lucas, uh, very, very helpful. Again, figuring out what sort of cumulative uh, sum probability we were meant to be calculating because we're kind of we're doing it wrong originally when we're looking at this. Huge shout outs too to some of my meta mates who were kind enough in the Slack channel when I was bringing up some of the issues to help push me in the right way and give me the support needed. Uh, huge shout out to y'all. Y'all the best. And on that note, speaking of the best, all these names here are some of the kind people that help support this channel to give us the time to be able to put the effort into these kind of ridiculous tasks that kind of spiraled out of control. Um, enjoy all the spreadsheets. It took me a while. I, um, I also have to figure out how to use Matplotlib. I'm probably not doing it the best. I think the legends are a bit messy, but uh, it'll get us all there, I hope. And on that note, that's it. Again, we stream on Thursdays. Hopefully you'll drop by. We can talk about some numbers, but otherwise we'll get some deck dives back up on the channel relatively soon. Woo! Thanks so much for watching. Hopefully you can build a better agenda suite. Cheers. <laughs>